by the Department of Commerce, Marketing of Baramada College in association with DCDC, Mahatma Gandhi University. I would like to start with a few inspiring lines by Martin Luther King. An individual has not started living until he rises above the confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of humanity. Accordingly, at this juncture of fast-paced developments in society, innovative and sustainable business models and their varied perspectives call for discussion. The seminar, spanning over three days, from the 7th to the 9th of December, aims to bring in a wide variety of such valid discussions and debates to focus. Hence, I feel privileged to extend a warm welcome to all the dignitaries, guests, and delegates to the inaugural session of this mighty initiative. Let us begin this great day on a positive spiritual note. I invite PM Anjali of third year marketing degree for reciting the prayer. Dr. K.M. Johnson, 
principal Bharat Mata College. From the beginning of the discussion regarding the seminar, he offered tremendous support and inspiration for the success of the event. I am glad to welcome you, sir. Dhyana Moolam Guru Murti, Pooja Moolam Guru Padam, Mandra Moolam Guru Vakyam, Moksha Moolam Guru Kripa. The Guru's form is the best to mediate a form. The Guru's feet are the best for worship. The Guru's word is a mantra. The Guru's grace is the root of liberation. A true academician a successful administrator, a renowned orator, a familiar figure in the media discussions, all above a person with high integrity and simplicity. This man not requires any introduction. He is well known for the academic field. It's a great honor for me to introduce and welcome the chief guest of the institute Chief Guest of the National Seminar, Dr. G. Gogumar. Welcome you, sir. The pillar of this institution, a person with a great vision, Reverend Father Dr. Abraham Odiyapurath, manager. Even in his absence, I will welcome Reverend Dr. Abraham Odiyapurath for this function. Father Jimmy Chengatahan, Achan is also uh, absent in this function, but in his absence, I welcome Father. <laughs> Ms. Nisi Kachupalian, Ms. Bini Rani Jos, Vice Principals of the Institution, always giving proper guidance and direction for the betterment of the departmental activities. A warm welcome to both of you. I would like to welcome various heads of department and faculty members from various departments to this national seminar. It is a pleasure for me to welcome all the delegates of the conference, UG and PG students, research scholars, and professors from various institutions. Your presence is highly appreciable by all of us. I welcome all the participants in different categories who are excited to present their ideas and views on the topic of history. I would like to welcome my colleagues, organizing committee members and volunteers of their constant efforts to make this seminar success. Finally, I welcome all my dear students for this national seminar. Once again, I welcome all and thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, I would like to call upon Ms. Zelna John my beloved colleague and the coordinator of the seminar for the presentation of the theme of the seminar. Thank you, Angela. The current research and commercial practices have recently experienced a boom in business model innovations. It is acknowledged that altering business model is a key strategy in bringing sustainable innovations to life. The ability to quickly and successfully adopt a new business model has a long-term competitive advantage of serving as a crucial lever for enhancing an organization's sustainable performance. Innovations in business models are thought to produce larger returns than innovations in products or processes. And sustainable business models may offer the added advantage of risk reduction and resilience, as well as more chances for diversification and value co-creation. Organizations are becoming more interested in implementing sustainable solutions to evade the set benefits. But often, attempts to bring about innovation in business model fall short. This is a significant negative impact on the economy and the business themselves, which causes further delays in the adoption of sustainable remedies. Despite the magnitude of these problems, the causes of failure are still not fully understood. Innovation in sustainable business model is a relatively new area of study. The development of the underlying fundamental concepts must be approached in a built-up manner, which calls for coordinated efforts from academia and industry. The priority would thus be the identification of key focus areas for the business model innovation processes to focus on 
the analysis of various obstacles to be overcome and the problem solutions available. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Occasionally playing the role of the voice of wisdom and always an encouraging hand on our shoulders, our beloved principal holds the place of predominance in the inception of any program. So with great delight, I now welcome Dr. Johnson Kayem, our respected principal, to deliver the presidential address. So, please. G. Gokumar, former Vice Chancellor, Central University of Kerala, our chief guest. Dr. Sujit is the head of the Department of Commerce, Marketing Section, our Vice Principals, Lissi Kachipuli and Bini Rani Rose. Dear participants from various institutions, dear teachers, and my dear students. I'm very happy to be present here on this, on this occasion when the marketing department is organizing a three-day national seminar on sustainable business model innovation and management practices, priorities and perspectives. Uh, I believe that this topic, sustainable business or green business, is a comparatively new game or new concept which may be the result of our understanding that we are living in an anthropogenic world. An anthropogenic world is a world which is really vulnerable uh, because of the uh, ecological changes, the atmospheric changes, the ecological catastrophe which humanity is awaiting. And we have been talking about an anthropogenic world, a vulnerable, ecologically, environmentally vulnerable world. And the atmospheric scientists of the 1950s and 60s have been talking about our contemporary period as a period of Anthropocene. Anthropocene uh, is a particular, uh, is, is a period from the industrial revolution to the present world. Maybe if you take the uh, last 2,000 years of human activity on Earth, we find that during the last 400 years, the human activity has had increased many fold compared to the previous 1,600 years. And uh, students of literature and philosophy would say that this is basically because of our anthropocentric attitude. Anthropocentric attitude means man-centeredness. Okay? We are centered on man. You know, that is how the Western culture or the whole world has been looking at uh, humanity. And we have been practicing what is also called the speciesism. Uh, we are privileging the human and we are neglecting the rest of the world. So, it's a kind of a hierarchical world where man becomes the one and everything else becomes the other. Okay? We do not take into account the objects which contribute in significant ways to the well-being of man. We do not take into account the vegetative life which is very important. We do not take into account our ecological conditions. We do not take into account the, the, the atmosphere with, you know, which is conducive for human existence and so on. So we have been quite greedy and avaricious. Uh, we have been quite instrumental and utilitarian as far as the use of our resources uh, have been concerned. And I believe uh, green business or sustainable business uh, is a business which should focus definitely on the, 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 the balanced use of the resources. The resource basis of the world need to be maintained. Uh, you know, keeping apart maybe our uh, avariciousness and greediness uh, in, in, in instrumentalizing, in having a utilitarian attitude. We should take care of the planet here in whatever kind of business, whatever kind of 
resource mobilization, resource use which we, 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 we take into account, which we, we do. So uh, I think this also goes very well with the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which uh, UN has already declared there are about 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which will take into account the sustenance of this planet here. And uh, I believe uh, this seminar, which the marketing department uh, is organizing for the next three days, will uh, you know shed a great light on different models of business which will be sustainable, uh, which will take into account the human existence, human sustainability, and the economic well-being of the society, and so on. And I also believe that this, this might inspire the young people who sit here uh, to take up uh, maybe uh, startups, entrepreneurship, new business uh, models, new business strategies. And uh, I pray that this seminar be fruitful and effective for all of you participants. I take this opportunity also to thank Professor uh, Dr. G. Gorguma for visiting our institution and uh, he will be talking to us. And on behalf of Haradmada College, uh, I also would like to uh, thank in particular the sir and wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our chief guest of the day is a man of distinct vision and a fountain head of illuminating ideas, an idol of knowledge, experience, and an inspiration to all of us. With immense pleasure, I hereby invite Professor Dr. G. Gogoguma, former Vice Chancellor at the Central University of Kerala, to light the auspicious lamp as a symbolic gesture to inaugurate this three day national seminar and then enlighten us with the inaugural address. Sir, the stage is yours. Dr. Johnson, Principal of Scholars. Dr. Tessie Kachapalli and Vidhi Jones, Vice Principals. Dr. Sujit, Head of the Department of Commerce Marketing. Ms. Rahina John. Other organizers of this three-day national seminar on sustainable business model, innovation and management practices, invited uh, delegates from other institutions, dear teachers, and dear students. Let me at the outset share my happiness 
in visiting this institution, which has tremendously contributed to the progress of education in the 21st century and built an ecosystem for strengthening the quality of education and character of the students. The ambience itself explains that. And for the students, this is going to be a great learning experience, both in the classrooms, in the seminars and conferences, and the kind of field experiences that you are going to get during your study period. Basically, I am a political scientist, but nevertheless, holds cross-disciplinary interests. I must also say that uh, the evolution of businesses, theories on business, marketing and other models, originally developed from a discipline called public administration which owes its source and origin from political science. I wanted to connect this because while we were students at the undergraduate level 55 years ago, we were taught about theories of management in our public administration classes. The importance of public administration and private administration. And also the levels of organization and how the national administration can be strengthened, the importance of morale in public services and private services, and various theories about management. But we never knew that uh, in future, this area is going to develop as an independent discipline, and later become one of the Significant areas where the future of the world, the future of the nation, the future of the people itself will be related to this. Let me also connect with one of the prominent uh, management experts of the earlier period called Peter Drucker, whom we studied during our public administration programs within the theories of management became the practically the management guru in his later avatar as a management expert and as a public policy expert. Incidentally though, but I still consider as a great uh, opportunity, I had the uh, occasion to meet the Professor Peter Drucker at the Claremont Graduate University, California, where I served as a Fulbright visiting professor. So I knew him through management books only. But I was surprised to see the, the Department of Management in the Claremont Graduate University itself is known as Peter of Trucker School of Management. During my interview with him, I, since I met him, I sought an appointment and uh, I had an interview with him, had dinner with him, talked to him a lot, published on the basis of his interaction later coming back to Kerala. One of his pioneering arguments about management was the primary lesson of management begins from kitchen. The art and practice of maintaining kitchen is the first lesson for the study of management. I still remember that. But I responded to him saying that in America, kitchens are not properly utilized because most of them eat outside and they keep very good kitchens and uh, like other settings in the house and the landscape, kitchen is also maintained very beautifully, unlike in India where 
most of most more than 95 percent of our activities regarding catering and food originates from Pitta. Although now there is a trend, what is called eating outside. But this is just to say that basically management originates from the ground situation, not from above. It was Drucker who said that housewives are the best managers of the world. He has several theories, but I am not going to that. My focus would be to connect with sustainable business model, which is very, very relevant in the present context. Dr. Johnson, in his uh, presidential remark, has mentioned about the significance of anthropogenic life and the developments that we had seen during the last 400 years. I would even say even the last 200 years have been were critical, significant and crucial. And ever since the industrial revolution occurred, there has been so much of dramatic development, phenomenal changes throughout the world, which led to many inventions, scientific discoveries, revolutions in transportation, communication, and many other technological accomplishments, which of course in the early phase was focused only to the developed areas, Western societies. Unlike today, where technology is going to be a great level. The best example is that all of you must be holding a cell phone in your pocket, which itself is a great achievement of innovation and technology, plus an area where you find interdisciplinary dimension connected with that, because it has everything under the sun. You can almost ask everything under the sun. You will get information, communication, as, and as rightly said, ICT, Information, Communication and Technology, has become the buzzword of 21st century. Some of us sitting here had experienced the pre-globalized area. But the younger generation sitting here belong to the millennia of the new generation population of the 21st century. Most of you are born after 2000. The point I wanted to highlight is that during the last 32 years, the world has changed, the India has changed phenomenally. I mentioned about the pre-globalization era, where state was instrumental for everything. State was connected with all part of our life. What we call in public administration as state leadership from cradle to grave. Everything was under public sector. Our first Prime Minister Nehru used to say, State and public sector are going to be going to lead the commanding heights of the economy. Practically, not only really economy, everything was led, initiated, guided, and mentored by the state. There was nominally private sector was there. Nehru was not against privatization, but he advocated mixed economy in which public sector would play a prominent role. From 1947 to 1991, nearly 45 years, this structure remained. But towards the end, uh, particularly India faced tremendous economic crisis, particularly shortage of foreign exchange reserve, which compelled the government of India and its leadership like Narasimha Rao, the Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh, the Finance Minister, and others to think seriously of changing the policy, public policy. When they approached the World Bank, United Nations and other principal institutions, they were advised for a paradigm shift. And this paradigm shift resulted in the arrival of what is called the neoliberal state. The neoliberal state in, was inaugurated with great suspicion. 
we felt that state will decline, the agenda of the neoliberal state will fundamentally alter the parameters of the state functions. To a great extent, it became true because your younger generation sitting here never understood this because they had not experienced, whereas our generation had seen both the prominence of the state on the one side and now the arrival of the market in a huge way. Market expansion beyond control. Particularly in India after 1991, we resorted to abandon the protectionist policy and promote economic growth based upon exports, not on import substitution. Finance Minister Manmohan Singh those days used to say that exports are going to be the mantra for development. Some of the countries who experimented this succeeded in setting up neoliberal development. But for countries like India, which is huge in size, both in size and population, and complex in many ways, opening up the market was really a challenging proposition. Already we were overpopulated. Mrs. Gandhi in the 1970s used to say, overpopulation is the biggest polluter. We are today discussing about sustainable business model. Overpopulation is the biggest polluter because naturally when human beings number multiply, the demand will increase, resources will be restricted, and competition for collecting these resources and utilizing these resources will become hectic and with the result, environment will be affected. So she was not wrong. She was right in saying that overpopulation is a great polluter. As all of us know, India is heading to become the largest populated country in the world. In another two years, India will overtake China and will become the largest populated nation in the world. As of now, we have 141 crores of population people. And population is multiplying. Fortunately for us, we have a young population. That makes a world of difference between the Western world and the developing world. The average age of Japan is 46. China is 41. America is 42. We have in India an average age of 28. And more than 52% of our India's population are below 26 years. And if you take age group 0 to 35, definitely 65% of the population are belong to below 35 years. Why I explain this is to say that we do have a very healthy, protective population provided we ensure the right kind of education, enable them to become healthy, provide the right kind of infrastructure, we can really contribute materially and philosophically for the transformation of the world. Already, statistics have shown that India has become the fifth largest economy in the world. We have overtaken Britain, which was our imperial power at one point of time. Today, we overtook, we overtook Britain to become the fifth largest economy in the world. We are heading for $5 trillion economy. We are heading for that. Furthermore, India has the second largest middle class in the world. Next to China, Maybe because of population again, but the fact is that with 35% of India's population belonging to middle class is huge. Out of 141 crores, you convert 35% with purchasing power capacity and not counted the upper class, which is not phenomenally very high, 
but it could be around 10 to 15 percent. At the same time, we do have people living below poverty line. That is also around 20 percent. But being the largest, second largest middle class in the world, second largest educational landscape in the world, next to China, hey, as a country hungry for education, country hungry for expansion and development, we have to be very, very careful when we open up particularly the businesses that are going to be important for the future of the society. It is exactly here we have to connect with the idea and the theory and discussion about sustainable business model. Already we have the whole population. Secondly, we have a very powerful consumer class. The significant feature of the middle class is they are consumer class. And the aspiration to become middle class also travels through the path of consumerism. So consumerism, consumer class. These are going to be vital structures in the future of a nation, particularly for India, when consumption becomes an irresistible phenomenon. It becomes overconsumption at some point of time and this overconsumption result in creating heavily unsuitable environment for our life. During our age, our youth age, we are not uh, trained to see the kind of fast food scenario and chains, fast food chain, food supply chain, and which today is spread not only in the towns, across the villages also, the fast food culture has emerged very, very significant. Supermarkets, the rise of market culture, and the market and the connection with commodity, over commodification, let me connect with some of my instinct with political science, <coughs> how over-marketization can endanger human lives. You know, one of the basic reasons for the rise of international terrorism is due to the free march of markets in the world. On September 11, 2001, when the terrorists struck America, symbolically or realistically, they targeted World Trade Center. Why? It was not just an attack against America, it was a direct attack on the market. We studied and we tried to analyze some of the reasons for that. And one fundamental reason that has come out of this is that market has become the new god a kind of a new worship and the kind of over-worshipping eulogizing market through consumption culture has resulted in the alienation of the people particularly from belief and faith. The more you become consumer class, the more you are oriented to market, the lesser you are concerned with the God as some sections of the people believe. I don't say that everybody believes in that. But at least some of them believe that over-commodification, over-marketization would ultimately lead to erosion of faith and as a result of which the new God becomes a market. That is why Islamic fundamentalists chose World Trade Center for attack. Now people, you are younger age, you are attracted to many ways. Now as of now, the kind of wave is going on is international football. Haven't we noticed that even from Kerala, there has been a criticism that you should not worship football like this. You can enjoy football, but not to the extent to which you forget your faith. Have you read that? 
Have you noticed that? There is an extreme feeling among some sections that over marketization, be it in culture, sports, commodification, overdoing that will alienate some sections of the people who believe that faith is more important than market. It was that probably which compelled a priest like Kuratai to say that football is not your God. Hmm? I am giving this for your introspection. Sports is great, wonderful. Even during our uh, youth and school days, we were all adoring sports. Those days we didn't have television. We had only radios. And of course, visiting some stadiums to see, but no, those days, not much cricket matches in Kerala. Hmm? You have a Kalamansiri Oval Cricket Stadium here. Hmm? Trivandrum also have a few like that. But we never saw a test match in our life. But we saw everything through the years, particularly through transistor. So people used to think, what are you listening? But in our concept, there is a picture of the stadium and the kind of bowling, batting, and how it is being taking place. This is to say that sports was enjoyed even in the early period. But today, under the marketization, you have even in cricket premier league. So everything is commodified. Sports is commodified. Film is commodified. Video, politics is commodified. Every aspect of life is now being converted into products and these products become prey to the consumers. So we are automatically changing our values from a ordinary consumer to become a committed consumer who would not spare any attempt to drop all these things. We net result of the overconsumption, over globalization, over liberalization has resulted in the extreme surpluses produced in the form of waste, in the form of trash, which particularly in third world countries, we are not trained to use it properly rather than throwing it elsewhere. So I, I am trying to connect that over commodification, extreme marketization has resulted in overuse of the products, particularly the mother earth, which result in environmental degradation. We have the direct results in the form of climate change. Now we are demanding climate justice. Conference of Parties 27 recently was held. India assured that we will be able to reduce carbon emission by 2070 only. We need time up to that. The problem is that industrialized countries were able to achieve industrial advancement and growth destroyed the green atmosphere, witnessed the depletion of the ozone layer, inevitable global warming, acid rain, and many other developments were shown. So environmentalists came first initially from Europe and other parts. There is what is called the green movement against over-consumerism. And this green movement organized to political parties and in European Parliament, nearly 20% of the members belong to green political parties. So green has become a movement. There is a rainbow, there is a ship called the rainbow, which tries to collect information from Atlantic and Pacific to see how seawater is also polluted. So for the first time, people like us saw the pollution of seawater directly when the Gulf War, first Gulf War occurred, when oil fields were destroyed following the Kuwait invasion and the American involvement against Saddam Hussein, and the destruction of the oil wells resulted in spilling of oils 
across the ocean for the first time we saw a climate change but we thought next year it will be okay it didn't happen now what is happening all the parameters of our climate calendar has changed we will have terrible rain during our autumn we will have terrible summer during christmas what was the original climate situation that was happening so the entire world is faced with climate issues climate change has become a very important thing most of the governments have developed a ministry for climate change and there is now the demand for climate justice now when the kyoto protocol meeting occurred for the first time america refused to join developing countries insisted that industrialized countries shall pay what is called the carbon tax for polluting the world after industrial revolution western countries did not agree to that rather they opposed this idea and insisted that developing countries shall reduce carbon emissions again another dilemma because we wanted to come up economically also and if you want to come up naturally we will have to produce and this production will be not only agriculture not only fishing forestry but and renewable energy inevitably we will have to touch upon industry manufacturing when you touch touch upon industry and manufacturing carbon emission becomes a fact agriculture is an eco friendly act forest fishing these are all eco friendly act renewable energy these are all eco friendly act but if you move from that and touch upon manufacturing and uh, industrial expansion naturally there will be pollution and this pollution and waste which of course you also know not only industrial waste not only waste from construction demolition of building and construction of new building not only because cement manufacturing but also because of what is called electronic waste e waste is something new what to do with the e waste and in some of the developed countries they have already tried to export their waste to developing countries they say that you have plenty of space why don't you dump it in your place this is otherwise called garbage imperialism so garbage is exported from developed countries to developing countries and giving some money you are asked to uh, keep it you are asked to immerse it in your soil and the net result is our environment becomes more problem problematic so given this dilemma how can we bring sustainable development united nations organization came up with the theory that sustainable development must become the goal development without considering the people without considering the environment without considering the plant life and animal life will destroy the future of the society so what we have to do is development by taking importance to the consumers the people the environment the animals the plants everything are to be considered this is what united nations appealed about sustainable development now as students of marketing and commerce and business management you are also getting exposed to sustainable business model what is sustainable business model under sustainable business model the leaders of the organization the company has to ensure not only economic viability but also environmental viability social viability without the economic environmental and social viability business systems will not survive it is not sheer profit that you should consider the profit that business model try to develop should be socially accountable usually it doesn't happen look at the hospital industry hospital industry look at the tourism industry in hospital industry it is told that for production of medicines related to severe diseases like cancer if the cost of production is only 1 rupee the market will insist for 100 rupees 
What is the range of profit? 99 rupees. Cost of production, 1 rupee. Doctors themselves have said that, particularly government doctors have accepted that to produce sustainable medicines at a sustainable cost today has become impossible. Unless research originates with a concept that research also becomes sustainable. Today research is connected to industry, but that industry is connected to market. And market is running after sheer profit. Where are you heading for? Is there any concept about sustainability? Let me give you one more point. You have heard about corporate social responsibility. I tried to follow that. I thought it's a wonderful idea that every company will share 5 to 10 percent of its profit for supporting the society, supporting the social development of the country or the region where they are operating. Can you give me data regarding the success of corporate social responsibility? I try to correct. And my feedback is that most of the time, multinational corporations, the companies and the corporations and the enterprises develop NGOs of their own, non-governmental organizations of their own. And then they try to conduct camps, melas, and other programs for advertisement of their products. And some element of free clinical testing, some kind of free food item distribution, freebies, etc. will be done in the name of welfare. But the entire expenditure for this propaganda will be written off under the heading corporate social responsibility. I, I, I would like to be corrected if I am wrong. That CSR, the original idea of CSR is Corporate holds a accountability for social development of the society. But so far, we have not seen corporates supporting educational institutions in a phenomenal manner. They may give one trophy, one, they may finance some conference, etc. But other than that, are they helping the poor students? Are they helping the poor patients in a hospital for medical and other aspects? In other words, Corporate social responsibility is far away from reality because they are influenced mostly by market consideration and use this platform for propaganda and self-serving purposes. So critically speaking, to my mind as a political scientist, I would say, so far CSR is a failure in India. I would like to be corrected if I am wrong. I am willing to change my position. But so far, I am not impressed as a social scientist that corporates have done their responsibility for the society. Sustainable business insists that not only economic profits are important, social responsibility and environmental balance are to be maintained by the industry and for which significance have to be given for environmental protection. But what is happening? environmental degradation. Of course, we can understand development is impossible without touching environment. I agree that. Because in an overpopulated country, the very moment you touch earth, you will have some impact upon the environment. But overdoing that, that impacts upon the mother earth. And that is actually what is happening. Some of you sitting here will be remembering about the Bhopal gas struggle in 1984. Even today, compensation has not been given properly to the victims or their, or their children or their successors. How come Union Carbide kill thousands of people and leave away? Why is it that the United Nations did not come forward to help? And we could not punish those people who did so much of damage in Bhopal, 1984. And even today, when companies start with new businesses, that is where sustainable business model becomes important. At least three things are important. Number one, environmental compliance. You have to comply with environment. You have to be prior, you have to be responsible, and you have to prepare in advance what kind of 
complaints that this company should take up without violating the environment. Second, when the company starts functioning, is it complying with the environmental rules? And third, after the functioning, once it is being done, whether the environment is protected? The best example is Kochi itself. The poor mother Peria is accepting all the waste from the companies in the industrial world. Am I right in Kochi? And the government is the government could not control them. All the industrial waste are pumped to Peria River. The best example is River Rice only. I used to visit uh, Ernakulam even during my childhood. So I can see the beauty of Ernakulam, the beauty of Peria, Alve and other places. Now comparing the kind of expansion that has happened, the encroachment upon the Vembenard Lake, and all of us have seen how two major <coughs> apartments, flats were pulled down because of the Supreme Court judgment. So, one has to see some nexus, and this nexus is between corporates, bureaucrats, political leaders. And the net result is that environmentalists could not fight properly for their cause, and even if they fight, except the media interferences and the judicial pronouncement, ultimately the commitment and the passion to protect an eco-friendly atmosphere is not developing. In this sustainable business model, will it permit palm oil production? Because developing palm trees will seriously affect the environment. But millions of acres in Western countries and Southeast Asian countries are utilized for palm cultivation. And the net result is depletion of the water belt. Similarly, many other trees are which damage the environment are utilized for commercial purposes. The problem is that sustainability and commerciality doesn't match together. You need to sustain, at the same time, commercialization leads to overproduction and the balance of social commerciality with that of environmental protection, I think the balance is not working very well. So, whether it is a small unit, small scale unit, or it is going to be a major industry, both whether it is a multinational corporation, everybody has to be careful. I need not have to remind you about the problems of the plastics. Studies have shown at the global level that only 9% of the plastics are recycled. Incinerator, another area where plastics can be destroyed, that accepts around 11%. So 9 plus 11, 9 recycling, 11% used by incineration. Remaining 80% of the plastics are living with us, which means we are pumping them to the earth and they are becoming part of the earth, which means it produces so many side effects and uh, it is told that as of now, every year, the global production of plastics is more than 400 million tons. 400 million tons of plastics are produced despite the publicity for what we call recycling. Recycling. So, individuals ourselves have to develop this culture. Companies have to develop this culture. And anything that is not sustainable has to be reduced if not abolished. Unfortunately, that is not happening. A sustainable business model has to manage not only with environment, but also with technology, also with innovation. So it has to be connected. It is like an arts, very well connected. It is environmental problems are not isolated. It is, linked to, it is linked to innovation, it is linked to technology. So, one has to develop environmentally feasible technology. In some of the capitalist countries recently have tried using eco-friendly programs. It is coming to our country also. Now you have uh, uh, green uh, 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 equipments, green equipments, like you have solar system in our houses. Hmm? 
solar system, solar heater, solar mic microphone. So mostly, in renewable, renewable energy can be utilized. Even for computers, green effect can be brought in so that we can reduce e the electronic waste consumption. So serious research, serious thinking has to develop for ensuring the balance between environment and technology, environment and the commerciality, environment and innovation. Otherwise, the greed of the market, which I started criticizing that, it has become the only potent god over, over some time, and attracting the consumer class, the stakeholders, the prominent section of the consumer class, followed by the entrepreneurs, then followed by the investors. Together creates a larger section, and we being part of this process of consumerism are becoming victims of over-commodification and over-consumerism. I said India has the second largest middle class in the world. 35% of 141 crores belong to this middle class. And more and more people aspire to become middle class. Natural. Let the middle class become the dominant section in Indian society. That is very good. But the problem is that Middle class with their education, with their employment, with their mobility, these things are good. But when it comes to what is called over-consumerism, use and throw, use and throw, definitely our value systems change completely. Sustainability will not survive without a value. The very sustainable value is threatened by plastics threatened by non-biodegradable items. If they are overproduced, the dangers are too many. India has now moved to that class, and it is exactly here, when we achieve economic growth, when we produce more middle class, let us not forget the mother earth, the environment. The green movement has to become stronger. The business model has to accept green practices. And without green practices and sustainable values, business models will plunge to the hungry commercial element who will multiply their profit to any extent without considering the humanity and the values related to that. Ultimately, we are destroying ourselves. Instead of rotating, instead of recycling, we are destroying ourselves, and with the result, the give and take policy is not there. It is not surprising that the epidemic has come. More and more epidemics will come if you destroy our environment. Minimum forestry is essential. But look at the kind of greed, how forests are pulled down. And now, some of the scholars come up with a new theory, man-animal conflict. Why animals are coming to man's place? It is not like that. We have entered their area. We have entered into the ecosystem of the animals. And then say, man animal conflict. Leopards are not visiting Kochi. Kochi has come to the leopard. It is other way that is happening. So when over urbanization takes place, over commercialization takes place, and villages and the ecosystem are destroyed, animals are affected, plant life is affected, the environment is affected. The net result is a recycling of epidemics, not the value system. So for the new generation society, particularly to the younger elements, younger sections of the society, particularly to students, we would say that as people have seen both the pre-globalization world and the post-globalization world, the challenges before you are numerous. Sustainability is not easy to achieve. It's not easy to achieve unless you have tremendous commitment. So when you become managers, when you become entrepreneurs, when you become investors, consider this element in your life. Do not over-consume. Do not over-produce. Maintain sustainability value. And ensure that nature, other living things are equally important for us. And then the sustainable value system will create more love and humanity and toleration among the people and also among other sections of this ecosystem. I wish all success for this seminar 
and have the privilege and the pleasure to inaugurate this national seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for those thought-provoking words. I would now take this opportunity to invite our principal to present our esteemed guest with an intimate token of our gratitude and appreciation.
let me invite the speaker of the session, Dr. Manjula, on the stage. Welcome you, ma'am. A very good morning to one and all present here. With all due respect to Dr. Professor Gopakumar, a veteran in the field of uh, education, Dr. Sujit, the head of the department, who has so well put together uh, the program. And I'm so glad to see that at the UG level and the department, he has taken an initiative of this kind. Because generally we find that these uh, kind of sessions are organized for PG students. And very seldom do we find uh, initiatives taken for UG level. And then I can also see some faculty members who are also coordinating and participating in this event. And last but not the least, the young and beautiful minds seated before me. It's always a rewarding experience to come and interact with young children like you. So I hope that the one hour of my talk, there's something for you to take. I think I would prefer to come down and stop up. Huh? The reason why I choose to come down and talk is because the podium will be like an uh, obstacle between you and me and you'll think that I've come from some other planet and uh, here to preach. Certainly not. Uh, please feel comfortable to answer to the questions that I may throw in between. Because all that I expect is that the audience are receptive, participative, and it is not a monologue. When one travels and comes a little distant, it is only the experience that one wants to take back. So I hope that you are all going to make my coming to Bharat Mata an experience that will be worth remembering. what I should be talking to you when I was invited for this seminar. As I already I put to you that I'm very, very glad that the college has thought of organizing things for students who are in the UG level. Now how you take things from here is up to you. And you can only take the horse to water, not make them drink the water really, right? I think the camera person may have a difficulty covering me because I intend to walk around. Creating startup ecosystem in education institutions. Now why might I choose this topic to address you people? The first reason, as they were reading my biodata, one thing that you would have realized, or if you had noted, if you had noted, was that I am heading the Entrepreneurship and Career Hub Initiative of the University of Madras under the Rashtri Uchitar Shiksha Abhyan, which is a scheme under the MHRD. And what have we done? Madras University is one of the pioneering institutions in this country. When I say pioneering, in every means of word that I have say, it is a pioneering institution because it was established in the year 1857 and it was the first university to be set up in the country along with the University of Mumbai and the University of Calcutta. So it's a 160 plus years institution which is supposed to be the mother of all institutions in South India including the university to which you are affiliated. So all that was branched out from the University of Madras. But again, why am I stressing the history? Because we need to know where we come, came from to know where we are, we are at present and where we know need to get to the, in the future. When the institution was started in 1857, you must be realizing that the period was a colonial period. Now what is the need for an institution, education institution in English medium to be established in a country in a colonial period because they wanted English-speaking people who could come and work for the 
English bosses. Clerks, media for jobs, office assistants, so on and so forth. But as time progressed and the Britishers were out of the country, then we had the government estab establishments, right? So we needed people who would look for government institutions. And I know in Kerala how popular getting a government job is, right? But slowly and steadily, even that mindset is changing for good. Why I say for good? Because where we are, and I am telling about my institution, because that I can claim with authenticity, because I have the information. 160 plus years of establishment, and it is now that we are realizing that we want our children to be job creators and not job seekers. It is now that we want to create an entrepreneurial ecosystem in our institutions, which in the US and other Western countries, you found that the, edu the education institutions, the universities, whether it was Harvard, Stanford, these were the institutions which were the, the hub for all the entrepreneurial ventures to start from. Never late, but at least now. Especially, I am very impressed with the way that Kerala government is also taking the startup initiative. I know a lot of friends who are working with the startup initiatives in Kerala, who are basically Keralaites, but staying in Chennai. And they are working with the Kerala government in setting up the startup institutions. So, very slowly, but very affirmatively, the education institutions are slowly realizing how to change it. Now, I am also working in the same domain, and what we did is, in the Entrepreneurship and Career Hub of the University of Madras, we have created several problem, programs. For instance, during the lockdown, when their institutions were all at the standstill, we had conducted more than 180 workshops online for the students. Training programs from bioblock fishing to mushroom uh, cultivation, you name it. And we had the training sessions done for the students and we threw it open for students from other universities as well during that period. So we were very vibrant during the lockdown period. We have, had comp we have a competition called as Tulir. And what we have done is, we have got the business idea. So it's a business model and a plan competition for students. We had several student teams register for that program. And they have went through several rounds. We gave them some training programs. I talk about it a little later, probably towards the end of my session. But we have identified eight teams to whom we have given seed funding to the tune of 25 lakhs as seed funding. We are providing them incubation space. We are providing them four exclusive labs in which they can vet their products and they, they can create their prototypes. We have an exclusive library with almost eight lakhs worth of books being created for these entrepreneurial students and the incubators to use it. So slowly our university is getting a setup which is going to encourage students to think about innovation and to make this innovation as a means and mechanism for their own ventures. And here that gives me a little uh, credit for talking about entrepreneurship because, as I told you, in the last two, three years, I've been only doing more work related to the entrepreneurship part of, in my university. So Peter Drucker, who is considered as the father of management education, he says that most of what you hear about entrepreneurship is all wrong. It's not magic. It's not mysterious. And it has nothing to do with genes. It's a discipline, and like any discipline, it can be learned. Now, that is the the hope that we have. See, it is a discipline, and anybody can learn it. Um, as they were reading the proper, they also said that in my department, we have an entrepreneurship club, and it's called as EDGE, and we have students as office bearers for that club. There are around 10 students who are the office bearers, and take, they take the decision, everything is done by them. I'm only the faculty coordinator for that. And uh, when we, you know, start the club and every time there is an orientation done for the first years. I always tell the students that the entrepreneurship club is not meant for those who want to become entrepreneurs. 
If somebody is thinking like that, then probably they are wrong because what is entrepreneurial skills about? Can somebody tell me one entrepreneurial skill? Can, we tell, can you tell me one entrepreneurial skill? Tell me a name. Uh, yeah. One entrepreneurial skill. Innovation. Think innovatively. Can somebody define learning for me? 
What is this learning? What is this learning? Learning is knowledge of skills. Hey, come here. Boss, come and sit here. You are the man I'm looking for. Hello, man. Ah, boss. Uh, learning is to gain uh, knowledge and skills. Learning is to gain knowledge and skills. Actually, if you see science, as a psychology, the definition of learning is Learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior as a consequence of an experience. This is nothing too much. It's revelation, huh? My friend, teacher. So learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior. Now you have to go back and think. Whether what, have you learned something in all these years? Because half the things that we learn, we never are able to recall. Because we never, it was never relatively permanent. After the exam, everything is evaporated. Semester exam, right, then you forget. Then there is not, it has not no business to do with us. But that is not how it should be. Correct? Agree or not? But I said that the learning is coming through some experience. Is there a learning for me today here? Yes. Yes. Correct? Because that's why I said that there is an experience that I am looking forward. And that experience will come only through the interaction that we have. Correct? Yes or no? Exactly. So, the experiences that the students get, that is why you come to an education institution. That can be a learning experience. It can be an experience of a sheer process through which you are going through. You write some exams. You have to come to the class on time. Why do they insist that you should go to class on time? So that you learn the art of time management. Submit your assignments on time. So that you learn to all the deadlines. But we feel that the teacher is asking for too much. Right? Most of the times, let us be honest. Most of the times we think that they are asking for too much. Uh, when I set an assignment in my class, I give my students the liberty to choose the date on which they want to submit an assignment. And suppose they tell me that we submit on Monday. I say no problem, you submit on Wednesday. At least two days more than what you ask for. But when we fix the date, then the date is fixed. It is always on or before Wednesday. Whether you come, if there is raining, there is shine, I am not bothered about it. Because you chose the date, I gave you two more dates, you should know how to plan your work, execute it, and to honor what you said you will do. I did not ask you to submit on Monday. You only said that you will submit on Monday. And having chosen that day, you should be able to do it. And it's also as a consumer or a customer, there are certain experiences that we go through in an education institution. Those experiences come with the interactions that we have with our fellow mates. Correct? Yes or no? The friendships that we have, we build, we go out with them, we hang out with them, we talk to them. If I am interested in automobiles, then I may be talking more about automobiles with my friends. Happens or not? If I am passionate about movie making, I may be discussing more with my friends to see whether they approve my idea. Happens or not? Correct or not? If I am a YouTuber, then I may look for what is it that my close friends have to say about what I have posted on the YouTube. If I am an influencer in that, that time, then I look forward for real critical inputs from my fellows. There is also the interaction that comes from the faculty who are in your department. Correct? Right? See, when I, when I spoke to a couple of your friends in the department, as I was coming and entering the institution, I was really very happy to see that there are some positive comments that I am hearing about some of the faculty. I know that it is these faculty who make that positive impact about your experience here. Because tomorrow when you have left the portals of this uh, and annals of this university or this uh, education institution, there should be these positive experiences that you should think about, which makes your stay here memorable as well as there should be something that you should have taken out as an essence from this place. And influencing the psyche of students and the mindset of students is what every faculty tries to do, like how the products try to get some
space in your mind, right? Every product is trying to get some space in your mind. Similarly, good things when you are young should find a space in your mind. That is one of the reasons why this, the parents make, it, make sure that the children get educated in a good education institution. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah. But before we go to the slide, I have two videos to show you. Okay? My first video is about an advertisement that Bonvita ran in during the Children's Day. How many of you have joined the DCOM program because you wanted to do the program? I told the parents that this is what I wanted to do. Okay, so those hands which have not come, because I can see only a handful of hands which are raised. So that means a lot of people were influenced by somebody to take the decision. A very important decision for you. Okay, it's education. You have several next steps through which you can make some corrective action also. You won't believe last week I had a speaker in my department who did have BTEC from the College of Engineering in India University, which is a very prestigious department. And after finishing her four years of uh, BTEC, you know what she is doing? She's taken up a full-time career as an artist, arts, arts work. And she is enjoying it. She said, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. And I said, why did you do the BTEC? She said, because in my family, everybody was a doctor. I couldn't make it to the medicine with just to cut off one or two months here and there. And I was hoping and hope I had that after getting into my BTEC. And the first year somewhere, I will get admission to medicine and I will go to medicine. But I didn't get medicine. So my parents said, biotechnology is very close to bio. And so you know biotechnology. They decided for me, I did four years. And during, during the four years, I realized that this is not what I wanted to do in life. And she said she is absolutely happy and enjoying what she is doing. That's what I said, that what we study, perhaps, need not necessarily and 100% define what we do as a job or a career. If it happens, then it's very nice. For instance, sometimes people ask me, why I didn't go to the corporate world after doing my MBA? Because I was very sure that I wanted to become a teacher. So I, I joined the teaching profession by choice and not by chance. And that is perhaps makes all the difference in the love that I have for my job. And it percolates in my classes, the interactions I have with the students, and the impact that I can have on the lives of them. There is a bone meter video, can you show that? Is the audio working? What if I told you this wasn't a toilet cleaner? It's actually born with it. Each of the packs come with a message. 
these Bonvita packs were forced to be something they are not meant to be, like millions of kids who are forced against their natural potential. As a part of the campaign, Bonvita also created a hashtag called Faith Not Force, which encourages parents to take a pledge and show faith in their child's dreams rather than forcing them towards a particular profession. A small thing in my kitchen, but it reminds me every day to have faith in my kids' choices. Thank <laughs> you. 